Good morning. Lecture 26B today. Uh, we're going to get into more of the end of Vietnam. Uh, we'll get to the end of the golden age of prosperity or the golden age of capitalism. We'll talk about the, the downfall of the 70s. Um, and that'll probably get us through today. Um, make sure you're tracking everything. Next week is a paperwork week. Make sure you've got your book, The Cold War, uh, but I think it's by Gladys or Gaddis. Uh, make sure you're working on that. The stuff has been posted. Uh, I may put a refresher there or a drop box of information on it so you can look at it. Uh, but that stuff's been posted since February. Uh, it is, I may extend the due date back a little bit, but make sure you're not forgetting to do that paper at Arabian style. Um, if you have questions, email me, please. And don't forget to get caught up on your reaction quizzes, please. Thank you. Okay, the end of Vietnam, 1973, achieved a negotiated settlement with Vietnam. Paris Peace Agreement uh, left in place the government of South uh, Vietnam, but also left uh, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong soldiers in control of parts of the South. Uh, U.S. draft will come to an end in this part. Basically, by 73, we are, we are starting the full withdrawal of American troops. Uh, U.S., uh, by 1975, uh, the withdrawal of U.S. troops has completely happened. The Vietnamization process of flipping everything over to the South Vietnam is finalized. Uh, in 1975, as the U.S. is almost completely out, rather than a few officials in Saigon, North Vietnamese officials launch a massive military offensive. Uh, South Vietnamese uh, government will collapse. U.S. will only evacuate the American embassy. All their troops are out. And it's a very dramatic moment. If you ever watch it, um, I don't know if, there's a, if we have time, there's a video on maybe I show a lot of times when I teach my other classes of the final pullout from the embassy. Literally, uh, South Vietnamese forces that are left will fly Hueys to American carriers, request asylum. Um, it's a pretty dramatic effect. Vietnam was a military, political, and social disaster for the United States. 58,000 Americans will be killed and die. Vietnam will undermine America's confidence in their own institutions, and our standing in the world uh, will collapse. Or not collapse, but we uh, way much downgraded. The biggest, bigger, or Domestically, the big downfall will be Watergate. We've been dealing with the whole Russian thing right now, collusion, all that, uh, which is a whole different context. There's some similarities, but it's really different at the grand scheme of things. Uh, but Watergate is something that is still very much in the thought of Americans, especially older Americans. In 1972, Nixon won a landslide victory. Um, I don't have it up here. Nixon won pretty much every single state, all the like, uh, the most of the electoral votes. One easily. Nixon was obsessed with secrecy and even created an enemies list. He was a paranoid man. Uh, in June of 72, five former employees, right before the election, uh, re-election committee took part in a break-in at the Democratic Party headquarters in the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C. It's photo down, that's a photo down the left. So Watergate's a building. It's just a hotel. Boss robbery played little role in the 72 election, but five people will be, will be arrested. The Washington Post journalist began publishing investigative stories that made it clear that there was a cover-up and came from those close to the president. Congressional hearings followed that revealed a wider pattern of wiretapping, break-ins, and attempts to sabotage political opposition, meaning this was all paranoia, trying to get an upper hand, trying to figure out what was going on. Revealed that Nixon had taped conversations in the White House, that he had a secret tape recorder, uh, and this they said, we need those tapes. Nixon refused. Archibald, Archibald Cox was appointed special prosecutor, just like Mueller on the Mueller report, and then we talked about the Star report. That was also the word of the week this week. Um, will be uh, the Cox will be basically investigating if there was any wrongdoing. Cox demanded the tapes. Nick, Nixon wanted Senator John Steinis to review them only. Cox refused this, so the special prosecutor said, "Hey, I want these tapes." Um, Nixon said, "No, you cannot have my tapes." And why Nixon said he had these tapes was for his autobiography he was planning to write. Cox was fired by Nixon, though I, if whether that was legal or not, he fired him. Uh, Attorney General Elliot Richardson and his deputy resigned in protest of this, saying, so the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General resigned over the firing of Cox, the special prosecutor. This is known as a Saturday night massacre, um, when all these people are fired or resigned. Um, what this signals was, there was a power struggle by the President to try to cover up stuff, um, and this becomes all public knowledge. Supreme Court unanimously ordered Nixon to provide the tapes, which he will eventually do. Now, on the tapes, um, there's a missing 12, 15 minutes of the tapes that we don't know what's said. 
Uh, but the tapes did reveal that Nixon had more knowledge than he had let on. Nixon's fall will be in on Watergate 5. Week after week, but revelations about the scandal unfolded. By mid-74, it was clear Nixon knew about the break-ins, at least right after, tried to hide it. And in August of 74, House Judiciary Committee voted to impeach Nixon. Um, Nixon will resign. Nixon's presidency remains a classic example of the abuse of political power. Senate hearings revealed many violations of the law by the FBI, CIA, over spying and other things. Liberals who had despised Nixon throughout his care, career celebrated his downfall. The thing about Nixon was the crime that he committed, he did not... From what we gather, he did not order the break-ins at Watergate. What his crime was, he tried to hide it. Once he found out about it, if he came out and said, listen, there was a Watergate break-in, people that are associated with my campaign broke in without my approval, this is all I know, moved on, it would probably, what? Over, overwin him, right? It would have breezed by. How many times do presidents have political scandals? A lot, right? That being said, Nixon tried to control it, thought he was above the law, and which resulted in his uh, res resignation. Would he have been impeached and removed from office? Yes. The votes were there. They were ready to impeach him and then remove him. Now, after Nixon's fall, this is going to usher in the end of the golden age of capitalism or our economic run that started in the late 40s, early 50s. The decline of manufacturing, low period of economic growth came to an end, uh, or lo long period. Uh, average American ended 1970s poorer than when they, the decade began. So the 50s and 60s has created a very good economic point for the U.S. The 70s is not. Military industrial complex was thriving. A dependence on the military and everything associated with the military spending everything. Vietnam spending went out the roof. Increased economic output overseas will hurt the United States. We have competition. American companies left the United States to go to places that were cheaper. Trade deficit will for the first time occur. Nixon took American off the gold standard. Henceforth, the world's currencies would float in relation to one another. Their worth determined not by treaty, but by international currency markets. So our currency, though we definitely have gold that backs it up, we are no longer tied to gold. We're tied to the market. And that's why currencies fluctuate all the time. A new term will be coming out in the 70s called stagflation. Nixon policies temporarily curtailed inflation and reduced imports, but however, in 73, a brief war broke out between Israel and its neighbors, Egypt and Syria. Middle Eastern Arab states retaliated against Western support of Israel by quadrupling the price of oil and suspending the export of oil to the United States for several months. It's also known as the oil embargo. This is going to create long gas lines in the United States. This is going to have a ripple effect. In the 60s, what kind of cars did America produce in the 60s, Dalton? What kind of cars? Brock, what kind of cars in the 60s? Diesel, maybe? No, not diesel. I mean, they did create diesel, but what kind of cars did they create in the 60s? Just like spaceship cars. Yeah. What kind of cars do we... Muscle cars. How many miles a gallon did those cars get? Like Zero. 10. Like 10, right? Really bad gas. But gas was super cheap, right? Did it matter what kind of gas mileage we got in the 60s? No. Fast forward to the 70s. This is going to be the first segue into fuel-efficient cars, and they're horrific. You have cars such as the Ford Pinto created in the 70s, which literally blew up if you hit it. Yeah, if you did not know it, the Ford Pinto is one of the unsafe, most unsafe cars ever created because the gas tank was in the rear. And any rear-ending accidents, which happen all the time, the car tended to blow up. So the point of this is the oil embargo drastically changes how Americans uh, are going to spend their money on vehicles, and it's going to disrupt a lot of different things. Rising oil prices ripple through the world economy. Also, Detroit's going to face the consequences. Instead of building the cool American muscle car, now we're going to start turning to uh, uh, foreign imports like Toyota. Nissan will start to emerge. Um, that's why we start um, having those rise of those foreigner cars. And now, the introduction, instead of the V8, you're going to have the introduction of the four-cylinder um, in that. Stagflation, though, this term, when this, this the economy comes to a slope, partly due to the oil, it's called a combination of stagnant economic growth and high inflation. So you have high inflation, no growth, very bad economic period going on. They call it stagflation. I mean, there's nothing really going on. It's not growing. It's kind of at a standstill almost, and it's not good for your country. 
into the golden age too. Now, the social compact elimination of well-paid manufacturing jobs throughout autom automation and shifting production to low wage areas and overseas. So manufacturing that had grown through the 40s, 50s, and 60s is now gonna face automation, meaning robots building stuff, automated assembly line, uh, cheaper overseas uh, production of stuff, the growth of China that will come later. Uh, it's going to hurt in Mexico, other countries, it's going to hurt American manufacturing. 1980, deindustrialization de in Detroit and Chicago included the layout, the last of, loss of more than half the manufacturing job in existence three dec de decades earlier. Detroit is the best example. Detroit went from being this bustling great American city to now it's pretty decrepit. Have you ever seen pictures of modern Detroit? It's not a good, I mean, it's kind of reviving coming back, but Detroit took a huge hit um, in the 70s. This is going to be a growth in the United States, though, but it's going to be in a different area. It's called the Sun Belt. Increase the political influence of this conservative region. It's also going to be the warmer part of the country. The southern states over from, um, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, south, all the way over to Arizona, uh, New Mexico. You're going to have a, a, a surge of conservatism in that area, but also that's where a lot of the new businesses, people are going to start moving. Ford as president. Gerald Ford was appointed to replace Vice President Agnew, who had resigned before Nixon did because of bribery. Seceded to the White House when Nixon resigned. Ford was a congressman who had been appointed the vice president, and now he finds himself president. He's the only person to never be directly elected for president, to be president. <coughs> because he was appointed to be vice president, and then when Nixon resigned, he became president. Uh, he's only president for a couple years, not a long tenure. Uh, he will appoint Nelson Rockefeller of New York, yes, an heir to the Rockefeller uh, oil, as his own vice president. Only time in history both president and vice president had not been voted into office. Uh, one interesting thing to note about Ford, Ford was a former football player for the University of, I believe, Michigan. Pretty athletic president, uh, but one of the first Saturday Night Live sketches features Ford falling down a flight of uh, stairs out of an airplane. So he got dubbed the clumsy president, right? Because he fell down the stairs. Now, the reality was Ford was very athletic, very, uh, he was actually in good health. Uh, but that falling down the stairs stigma stayed with him um, for a long time. Just to put it in perspective, here, I'll pull it up real quick on YouTube. Um, it's really funny. But the fact that they made a big deal out of it is kind of silly. Yeah, here it is. And he's actually helping his wife, so that's what's even... For President Ford, the year seemed full of snags. In June, he fell down the plane steps on arriving in Austria. <laughs> but a whole lot more serious were the two attempts to assassinate him. The first occurred on two attempts to... The whole lot more... <laughs> but a whole lot more serious were the two attempts to assassinate him. The first occurred on... So... Obviously, um, the, the presidency has taken a little bit of a beating during this period because of the resignation of uh, Nixon. And then he falls down the stairs. It's just kind of like, you know, it's just not going well. For a pardon Nixon, this, this is actually probably what cost Ford the election in 76. He pardoned Nixon. So it's about a month after taking office, he pardoned Nixon. Very unpopular move. So, for example, if, we'll just say for argument's sake, if Trump had been indicted and was impeached and was facing jail time, what do you think most people would want in this country? Would they want the trial to go on to see what the evidence was and everything? Yes. We'd want a conclusion, right? Ford pardoning Nixon basically said it's done and over with from moving on. Now, is it good for a president to be in prison? No, it's not, is it? 
So can you understand why Ford pardoned Nixon? Did Nixon break the law? Absolutely. But was it better for Ford to pardon him and have him live the rest of his life in disgrace or have him go through a trial, have the country go through months, if not years, of political turmoil dealing with Watergate? Does that make sense? I'm not saying it's the right move necessarily, but I can understand why Ford did what he did. Either case, it's very, very, very unpopular. Uh, people wanted it to go to light, and now it's going to be stopped. Ford urged Americans to shop wisely, reduce expenditures, and wear wind buttons. Whip inflation now. I don't know about you. I would never have worn such a button in my life. Win now. Whip inflation. Mm, no. You whip inflation. I'm not going to wear it. Buttons were big in the 70s, by the way, for campaign stuff. During the steep recession of 74 to 75, unemployment exceeded 9% the first time since the Great Depression. It had been that high. Um, in 1975, the Helsinki Agreement recognized the permanence of Europe's post-World War II boundaries. So be, this was also not a popular thing. Uh, in 1975, Helsinki Agreement basically said the Soviet Union, the United States, all these countries would recognize the current borders of Europe as permanent. So East Germany, West Germany, etc., right? The reality is, how long will that probably actually last? That agreement? Not long. About 15 years max, because what happens in 89? Foreshadowing moving forward. What happens in 1989? Come on, remember. What happened in 1989? The year of revolutions. Nope, Soviet Union falls in 91. This is the first step for the Soviet falling, though. Someone else falls. In the words of John Cougar Mellencamp, the walls come crumbling oh, down. Yeah, the Berlin Wall! Yeah, I'm not a good singer, sorry. The Berlin Wall collapses. So, the Helsinki Agreements is actually not that long of actually being in place. The end of the Golden Age 3. The Carter Administration, which honestly in today's world, Jimmy Carter would probably never get elected. Uh, in 1976, Jimmy Carter, a former governor of Georgia, narrowly defeated Ford. It was a very close election. This was not a resounding victory for Jimmy Carter. Carter was an unknown and ran as an honest man. He ran as a good person. After Nixon and after Ford's kind of debacle of pardoning him and all this, people wanted an honest man. Carter fit the bill. He was a born-again Christian. I will never lie to you, he said, which was very appealing post-Nixon years. Was not a bad person. He's, he's still alive. Jimmy Carter is still alive. He is the oldest ever president to live, meaning he's 97 years old. 94, just passed George H. Bush as the oldest ever to, uh, president of his length of life, I should say. Um, his pastors are making government more efficient, protecting the environment, and raising the moral tone of politics. Like I said, he's a good, happy person. He was a peanut farmer. He's from Georgia. He's the honest, good, true person. I'm going to tell you the truth. The problem is uh, he's, he's ill-equipped to deal with international problems. Uh, and domestically, he kind of is overwhelmed. Economic crisis. Uh, Democratic Party found itself ill-equipped uh, for the crisis that would unfold. Uh, enacted the deregulation in the trucking and airline industry. 1980, Congress repealed usury laws, laws that limit how much interest lenders can change. Carter also believed in use of nuclear energy. Uh, but basically, all of these economic policies he tried to do were not working. He reduced the dependence on imported oil, which I will say the best thing he probably did with this was use the expansion of nuclear energy. Think about our power plant. Our power plant was built, was it late 70s, I think it is? That's part of this initiative from Carter. Now we just need to, we just need to have like a rowing team to get there every day now. Now... As he expands the nuclear program, it's also going to take a hit. 1979, Three Mile Island. Released a large amount of radioactive steam into the atmosphere. Was there actually much damage done? Probably not. No, there wasn't. Um, Does Russia already have their... No, and I, I was going to bring that up. That's, I'm glad you brought that up. Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania. It's an island where this nuclear power plant in a river. So it's surrounded by water, right? The incident does not contaminate the area. Essentially, there was a malfunction 
um, in one of the valves, I think it was, and it released this steam um, as a emergency measure. And everything else, well, it shut down. All the other emergency procedures went as they should, from what I remember and what I've read. Uh, Jimmy Carter actually was, I believe, a, he was in the Navy. He was a nuclear, he dealt with nuclear energy in the Navy, which they have reactors on ships, right? Submarines, aircraft carriers um, have nuclear reactors for fuel. He goes there personally, tours it, tries to restore American confidence, but he supported the nuclear energy program. People were behind it, but then after this incident, people are starting to freak out, right? Was it really that bad of an event? No, it could have went a lot worse, but fortunately for Americans, we are pretty good on safety protocol most of the time, right? In fact, we've had an incident at our reactor before where there had been uh, a warning lights went off. We've had uh, issues that had to be corrected. It's not uncommon. The difference between Three Mile Island and Chernobyl is huge. We listened to the warnings. We followed the book, right, with the 79 Three Mile Island. Chernobyl... You want to know what really, if you want to break Chernobyl down to a simple point that's about eight years later in the Soviet Union? Well, one, Americans are open about a lot of stuff, right? Like our energy, our resources, there's things that we, Americans as a republic, sorry, we're not a true democracy, we're a republic, I'll get off my soapbox there, okay? We're open, right? We have a lot of records released, hence why the Mueller Report, Watergate, Star Report, all of this stuff we want to know because that's part of our society. In the Soviet Union, that was not the case. Everything was controlled by the government, a limited amount. Literally, how many of you ever drove uh, a car that has a check engine light come on? Or the little, or like a little, a little like wrench or whatever. That's what my car does. I still drive and haven't taken it to the shop. I probably should. It needs a, It's got a lot of miles. It needs some work. But. That indicates a lot of times, about 50% of the time, there's maybe something mechanically wrong. Maybe major, maybe minor, right? Maybe it's just a belt. Chernobyl literally had warning sites going off that there was a problem. And the Soviet doctrine, they ignored it. They tried to bypass it. How many of you have ever seen the movie Armageddon? 1997 movie Bruce Willis, Blow Up the Asteroid, right? The Russian cosmonaut they pick up. When the ship's not working, he goes, this is how he fix things in Russia. He starts beating it, right? Gets it to work, right? That's a situation you're noble. We can ignore it. We'll do it the Russian way. Hopefully it works for the best. Well, in the case of Chernobyl, what happened? Boom, radiation. Pripyat's evacuated. Thousands of people will end up dying from stuff. Does that make sense? So that's the difference between Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. We actually do, for the most part, go through the steps, but this... After this, we don't build any new. We only started recently building new power plants again that are nuclear. Carter spoke a national crisis of confidence after Chernobyl and then the economy in general. He said um, and seemed to blame it on American people themselves. He went on television and he blamed Americans. One thing you're not going to do when you are trying to fix a problem in this country is blame Americans. Is that appeal to you? If I told you, okay, we have a flood problem, but it's all your fault. Is people going to react well to that? No. If I said, hey, we've got a flood problem, how can we fix this together? Is that a better way? So when he went on television, he was not a polished speaker on live television. He blamed Americans for self-indulgence, self-assumption, consum assumption, consumption, blamed Americans, right? If I went out to the bottom and told the farmers, like, it's all your fault for building the levees, where that, that's not going to accomplish anything, is it? Or why are you living on the bottom? That's not going to fix the problem, is it? So you can see where he makes a lot of enemies here, right? Instead of saying, we use the flood example again, saying, okay, we know the core has got some issues, but what can we do down here to help fix and help us going forward? What can we, where can we work together? Now, the end of the Golden Age 4. The... One of his big things was the emergence of human rights and politics. Promoting human rights became a centerpiece of American foreign policy. That's a big thing about Carter. He's an honest person. He wants human rights to be at the forefront of his presidency, which he does. He does okay with it. If it probably one of his stronger suits was being honest. Um, but in D.C., 
being purely honest is not going to get you reelected. In 1978, cut off the aid to the brutally dictatorship governing Argentina. Um, this will shift the American view around the world of like, are we going to are we going to support dictatorships just because they are anti-Soviet or anti-communist? So he starts shifting the American perspective, especially in Latin America. We offered an unconditional pardon to Vietnam era draft dodgers, resistors. This one's important because this allows dodgers who had gone to Canada and other parts of the world to come back to the United States. They were pardoned, no questions asked. There were thousands of American uh, men that had been drafted that fled the country so they wouldn't have to serve in World War or Vietnam. He has the Camp David Accords, which is a highlight in 1979. Israel and Egypt meet. It is a highlight. The David Accords, for the most part, were a success at that point of trying to get Israel and Egypt to work through their differences. Transfer of Panama Canal was set by the year, for the year 2000. This was unpopular at the time, uh, but he felt that Americans should eventually give Panama back to Panama, which we did. 2000, it transferred back to Panama. We are no longer in control, but we are a protectorate of it <coughs> as a military oversight. Just basically, the Panamanians, or we feel it's threatened, we can go in there and help protect it. Okay. Um, the end of the Golden Age... Five, the Iran crisis in Afghanistan. This will be probably the last portion for today. Yep, this will be the last slide. So without a doubt, the biggest thing that has a incident on Carter's record, besides him kind of being overmatched, was the Iran uh, crisis. Uh, Iran was a strategic location and big oil provider in the 70s. In 1977, he traveled to Iran to celebrate relations with the country. They had a king. Uh, Iran was very pro-West at this point. They were very liberal-minded. Women would, if you ever look at uh, uh, the 70s Iran, women were wearing bikinis. And why I bring that up is Iran today is what? A strict Islamic country, right? Islamic countries that are very strict-minded, adhere to Sharia law, women are always covered up. They do not go wear bikinis. Their faces are covered, their bodies are covered, right? So Iran in the 70s, very much different. Now, a lot of Iranians didn't like their king. He was kind of corrupt. We supported him. Um, in 1979, a popular revolution inspired by the exiled Muslim cleric Ayatollah Khamoni overthrew the Shah and declared Iran an Islamic Republic. Basically, they overthrow the king. Radicals come in, completely overthrow the current government in Iran. In 79, Carter allowed the disposed Shah to seek medical treatment. He had cancer in the United States. The Kamali's followers invaded the embassy at, that was in Tehran, which is the capital of uh, Iran, and seized about 66 hostages. So our embassy had been in there kind of tensely, and then when the Shah comes to the United States for treatment, they storm the embassy and take 66 hostages. Some get out. The movie Argo with Ben Affleck, kind of goes into detail of what happens with this and the attempt to get them out. Um, they did not get their freedom, though, until January of 1981. So they're going to be about two years in captivity, most of these hostages. The Soviet Union sent troops um, into Afghanistan. Afghanistan it was a pro-friendly government threatened by the Islamic rebellion there as well. This is the, Viet the Soviet's Vietnam, like comparatively. Afghan was a pro-communist government sympathetic to the Soviet Union. And then when the Islamic rebellion happened in Iran, it threatened to spill over into Afghanistan. They didn't want, and it did. The Mujahideen, as they were called, um, were trying to overthrow the Soviet-controlled government there. That sounds all familiar, doesn't it? Instead of the United States being the victim of it in the, this case, it's the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is going to spend about a decade in Afghanistan with the same results we had in Vietnam. Oh, by the way, uh, guess who we help support in the Afghan war? The Mujahideen. We give them weapons to fight the Soviets, right? Oh, by the way, guess who the Mujahideen become? Al-Qaeda terrorists. Al-Qaeda, the Taliban. Not ISIS. ISIS is a new generation. That's a whole different thing. Osama bin Laden was a Mujahideen. So Carter caused 9-11. <laughs> I would not say that. You, not that at all. Nix, or Reagan is going to support the Mujahideen heavily. But at that period, it made sense, right? I'm not going to blame Reagan or Carter on Al-Qaeda. Now, the Carter Doctrine, the president announced that the United States would use military force if necessary to protect interests in the Persian Gulf, but he never backs it up. 
One of the worst disasters was he, he organized a Western boycott of the 1980 Olympics over all this. Uh, funneled aid to fundamentalist Muslims that later became the Taliban, like that's the Mujahideen. But also, these uh, hostages, this is a picture of some of the hostages. There's a 1979, 1980, there's an attempt by American special forces to go in and get the hostages out. Today, we think of American special forces as awesome, right? Elite, right? They got Osama bin Laden, they did all these cool raids, Navy SEALs even, whatever, right? 1980, it's a complete disaster. We are, this is a laughing stock. Our special forces cannot sneak into Iran, get these hostages out. The planes literally ran into each other. And all servicemen that were on this operation died. Disaster, right? So you can see Carter now is in a, in a predicament that is not good for him. That being said, it didn't help that I think it was the Ayatollah Khomeini or one of his underlings said that the hostages would not be released as long as Carter was president. Guess what? The inauguration day, when Reagan sworn in as the new president, guess who's released? The day he has sworn in, the hostages are released. Anyway, we'll get into more of the rise of conservatism um, in the late 70s, early 80s, and we will get on the Reagan train starting tomorrow. Have a good day.